Rich from Town Hall again, and Alex Smith from CRNC. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for sticking around. I hope you're having a great weekend in Atlanta and at the Red State Gathering. It's almost over, so thanks for hanging in there and hanging out with us. I'm Katie Pavlich, editor for Town Hall, uh, and I am here with Alex Smith, who is the uh, chairman of the CRNC, and we are going to first talk about reaching out to the millennial gener generation, the generation after the millennial generation, and then we'll also leave some time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, we're seeing more and more, uh, in terms of public polling at least, um, that there's a huge disconnect when it comes to how young people see the form of economic government that they want. Uh, socialism has been propped up as a, a favorable way uh, for the economy to be organized, and when you look at polling, uh, young people actually think that socialism is nearly uh, com competitive and equal with capitalism. But when you ask them a deeper question about what does socialism mean, they can't define it. And so, of course, we believe that we have to reach out to young people and make them think about how socialism actually would affect the lives that they live and the choices that they make. So Alex is on the ground around the country talking to young people all the time on college campuses, organizing young people who are organized in their own communities. So I want to start by giving her the floor to give kind of her perspective on the state of young people uh, in the country when it comes to where they're politically leaning and where you think they're going to be sitting when it comes to the next election. Well, thank you so much, Katie, and thank you so much to Red State and to Town Hall for having me. I'm, I'm so tremendously honored to have this opportunity to talk to you about millennial voters. It's what I've done two years of my life is, uh, is go out there and to try to find ways that we can bridge the gap between the Republican Party and conservative principles with the millennial generation because the truth is a lot of them are conservatives like Katie was alluding to but they just don't know it yet uh, and there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of promise for this generation and there's also the need for our party to reach out uh, to this generation for uh, electoral reasons for demographic reasons uh, and so that's the sort of work we do at the College Republican National National Committee. Um, I was elected as national chair two years ago. Um, I started out as just a regular CR on the ground at Catholic University in DC. I was like, you know, 18, so excited. I don't even think I unpacked the stuff in my dorm room before I ran out and joined the college Republican table. <laughs> and, you know, I really, I mean, I think all of us in here can appreciate the liberalism on campus and the, the really hostile um, environment that you feel from the administrators and from uh, the professors alike. And so that college Republican table provided that safe harbor where, you know, you could be with like-minded people and just became you know, the absolute love of my life for the last, you know, uh, last couple of years. I, I never expected to be national chair, and in fact, when uh, I got to be national co-chair, that was 2012, I was in my second year of law school. I really thought that that was my graceful exit out of this organization. I was like, all right, guys, like, I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm out here. And, uh, you know, I saw how powerful the youth vote was in 2012 to deciding the whole course of the presidential election. And so I said, all right, I have one more fight left in me in this organization. I'm going to run for national chair myself and see if we can correct the problem. So um, I was actually just reelected back in June. Uh, and what we've been doing at the CRNC is taking this 123-year-old organization and trying to adapt the grassroots part of it to an independent expenditure part of it that will uh, seek to win back elections for Republicans on campus with young voters. Uh, and so, I mean, just to put into perspective for you how powerful 2012 was with young voters, if you had started the voting age at age 30, Governor Romney would be president today. So that is how powerful millennials were to deciding the whole course of the presidential election. And, you know, I think I often hear out there when, when I speak to different crowds, they're like, oh, Alex, like, you know, we don't have to worry about millennial voters. They're not going to come out again in 2016 the way they did for President Obama. He was so cool. They loved him. They loved hope and change. They're not going to come out again. You know, 
uh, the pattern of young people being more involved in elections actually started under President Bush, not President Obama. Um, the youth vote has grown by one percentage point every single um, presidential cycle for the last four presidential elections in a row. Uh, so it started off about 16% in 2000, went to 19% in 2012. So in 2016, by that sort of history, we can anticipate that young voters will make up 20% of the voting population out there. And I mean, that's an enormous number to contend with. Something I also kind of hear out there is, oh, Alex, we don't need to worry about young voters. They're, they're gonna get more conservative as they get older. You know, they're gonna get married, they're gonna buy a house, become parents. Well, first of all, our generation can't afford to do any of those things right now, <laughs> if you haven't heard. Um, and, you know, we actually saw in the last election how young voters, or sorry, voters ages 30 to 34 were the only age demographic that improved for the president a second time around. So this generation isn't just growing up conservative on their own. They're not just, you know, growing into Republican voting habits the same way uh, previous generations might have. Uh, but pretty much the, the thing that I hear out there that troubles me the most is when people tell me, Alex, we're not going to reach out to young voters. You want to know why? Because they're all liberal. We don't want to talk to them, and, and they're a lost cause. That is just fundamentally untrue, uh, and it's irresponsible given that what we face in the next election, uh, given the fact that they will decide the presidential election again, and if we don't win some of them back, we will not win the White House. That is a mathematical reality. Uh, and so, you know, we did a lot of research at the CRNC after 2012. It was kind of in that period where everyone was soul searching, those very cold months after <laughs> the 2012 elections. Uh, and we, we went on, out on the road, we did focus groups, we did surveys. And what we did is we specifically asked young people, you know, about these smaller government principles, like Katie was talking about, how a lot of times these bigger terms out there, they often get conflated with ideas that aren't really what they mean, and I think for young people it can, at times, uh, it, the, the terminology can get confused with the actual principles. And so we asked them questions like, do you think government is spending too much money? Yes. Do you think that big entitlement programs like you know, Medicare and Social Security are unsustainable? Yes. Um, and do you think that government is doing too much that would be simply left to the private sector? And the answer was yes. So they agree with us on smaller government principles. A vast majority of them do. What they don't do, do though is they don't connect that to the Republican Party brand. And if you think about why that is, it, you know, think about where our party's dollars have gone. Direct mail, television, radio ads, calls to landline phones. Um, I don't know, Katie, when was the last time you picked up a landline phone? <laughs> Not for a long time. <laughs> So, I mean, our generation just isn't getting uh, information and especially news via those channels anymore. I mean, the majority of millennials get their news information from Facebook. They rely on their peers to sort of validate the stories out there and validate uh, the candidates that are out there. They're looking for sort of peer approval and um, peer sharing on these issues. And so, you know, I think that that could very easily explain why we've done so poorly with millennial voters in the last couple elections. We have not been talking to them where they are. We haven't been on Facebook. We haven't been on YouTube, Pandora, Hulu. We haven't been on campus talking to them. And so that's what I've been working on for the last two years with my incredible team at the CRNC and all of our 250,000 college Republicans across the country. Uh, we've been working to very much fix this problem for our party. We view that as our very sacred responsibility, uh, and I'm happy to talk about more about what we, what strategies we've employed, some of the new things we've done to help capture them. Yeah, so I guess that that would be my question for you: is you know you see young people in the millennial generation in particular, and for the for the Republican Party to write off the millennial generation is is really suicidal because it's the largest generation this country has ever produced. The millennial generation is a hundred million people strong. Um, and it's really important to tap to tap into that. And when you look at the way the millennial generation carries themselves, uh, a friend of mine, Kirsten Solstice, just wrote a book called um, The Selfie Generation. And it's all about um, the millennial generation and how they're actually very individual. 
They all have an individual character. They want to make individual choices. They all have more choices with whatever it is, whether it be an iPhone or opportunity in terms of the workplace of, of making their own decisions than they've ever had in the history of the country. They have more opportunity now in terms of choices they have on their daily lives and personal future than anyone ever has. And yet they still don't connect that to um, a political party necessarily. So my question to you is, in the, in the 2008 and 2012 election, uh, the DNC and the Democrats and the Obama team and the Obama campaign did a very good job of doing what you just mentioned that the Republicans weren't doing, reaching out on social media, building a huge digital infrastructure. Has the CRNC decided to try and build something like that to catch up to what the left was doing? And is it going to be effective moving forward? Yes, so I think your question is one of both form and substance, and I'll start with the substance part of it first because this is probably what I get the most questions on. I think that all of us in here have some awareness that we were sort of communicating in the wrong places and we need to sort of be better about that and I'll definitely address that. But substance-wise, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is this disruptive economy out there. Millennials have fundamentally changed the way our economy works. And everything that works for a millennial in this economy works because it's organic, it's bottom-up, it's community-based. I mean, think about the way we communicate via Twitter, uh, the way we shop for things on Amazon, the way that we learn things from YouTube. I mean, this is all stuff that's organic. and it works for us. I mean, this is how our generation operates. And so what our goal was is recognizing that everything that works for them actually has those qualities, qualities we want to see sort of in our, in our economy and our government structures. We said, okay, all right, so everything works for you in the palm of your hand on your smartphone. It's community-based. It's, it's organic. It's natural. So then why do you want a top-down government telling you what health care plan you need to have? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's completely incongruent with the way that you lead your lives in every other aspect. Um, and so we actually partnered with a group called New Republican. Um, their stuff can be found at newrepublican.org. It's an absolutely amazing organization. They, they, what they seek to do is to sort of apply um, marketing principles to the Republican Party um, to see basically how we can not change our principles, but just change the way we talk about them for a new generation, just update our language, because uh, that's half the barrier in some cases. Uh, a great example came from our focus groups. Uh, we had, uh, so we, we were asking the question, you know, how strongly do you agree with the statement, we need to fight big government? Now, I think fighting big government has been like the cornerstone of every Republican campaign since I, you know, since we've been involved. I, I mean, it's a phrase that I hear over and over and over again. And certainly, I mean, I think that, you know, we understand what that means. We have an appreciation for that. Um, so we, we kind of posed this to the, to the millennial voters. And by the way, our focus groups, they were really interesting. They weren't just made up of... Um, you know, sort of a cross-section of 18 to 29-year-olds, we actually chose Obama swing voters. So these were people that specifically were selected because they were on that metaphorical fence, and at the end of the day, they tipped it to Obama, and we wanted to understand why. And so we asked them, we said, all right, how do you feel about the statement, we need to fight big government? And we got, I mean, like, stares back at us, crickets in the room. And finally, like, one brave person sort of piped up, and she's like, what, what do you mean by big government? Like, I don't understand this term. And, you know, at first blush, it might seem to all of us, oh, that's ridiculous, how could they not understand? When you think about it, though, for a millennial, big is not a scary word. You know, big is our world. You know, it, it, it fits on a smartphone. We can have it in the palm of our hand, tweet something out to millions of followers in under a second. I mean, that's what big is to, to millennials. And it's not scary, and in fact, it's a little exciting. Um, what is scary is an intrusive government. So when we rephrased the question and we were like, okay, so you know, what about a, you know, a government that's trying to you know, spend too much, like I said before, they were like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I don't agree with that. So simply by not repeating a phrase that we've just said over and over and over again, just sort of said canned um, <laughs> since like the beginning of time, it feels like, just simply updating our message to a generation that has experienced more of this economy through technology and more of their experience comes from technology, we could really win back a lot of people. So we partnered with this group called New Republican. They helped us adapt some of this millennial, or this, uh, this language for millennials. Uh, we poll tested it in the summer of 2014. We put together a um, sort of a language compendium. It's found at yiam.gop. And 
basically what it is, it's a five minute long video and these are all phrases that we've poll tested with millennials um, in terms of what works in uh, describing ourselves as Republicans. Uh, this was the language that we put out on campus last fall when we were in our swing states. Uh, you know, this is the language that we use regularly in our social media branding at the at the CRNC, and it's available for anyone to take and to adapt for their own purposes here and anywhere else. Uh, so that was the first thing that we did is we addressed the, the substance. And on the form part of things, um, you know, we realized that we were lacking in two places. We were lacking on campus and we were lacking online. And what do I mean by on campus? So we have great college Republicans, quarter million of them out there across the country working on 1,800 campuses, really, really brave souls out there, you know, putting up those tables day in and day out. They're going to get harassed. They're going to get bullied. Someone's going to take their literature, throw it away. I mean, the, these guys are really brave out there. And what we were doing in the past, I mean, not just we, but I mean, other organizations as well, as we were going to those campuses, we were saying, all right, college Republicans, you're our volunteers. We're going to take all of you away from campus. We're going to stick you in a victory center where you're going to be making landline telephone calls to people who are older than you that you don't know. <laughs> now, I know in retrospect, that seems like how could we have been doing that? You know, 2012 was all about the millennial voter. That just seems like an obvious deficit. But, it, you know, I mean, that's the way we had been doing things. And truthfully, in elections where older voters were more important to turn out because they made up a greater share of the voting population, that model worked. Um, but it didn't work in, in the 2008 and 2012 elections, and we were basically depriving our campuses of their best resources. So the first thing we did is we put our field reps on the campus. Instead of having them recruit away from those campuses, we had them recruit on campus and reach out to non-traditional political groups, the fraternities, the sororities, the business clubs, all of these places where we have involved students um, that you know, want to know more about politics, they want to know more about the world around them, and simply just hearing from us, just simply just starting that conversation could make all the difference in the world. So we had fantastic success. We made contacts with thousands of student leaders in 16 key states around the country last fall. We were, you know, it, it was kind of heartening and it was kind of disappointing at the same time. We had uh, one guy come up to our field rep in Maine. Um, so we were there obviously, um, you know, hoping to impact the governor's race that was going on up there. And this guy, you know, this guy from the sports team, or I think it was the hockey team, came up to our field up and was like, you're the first person from the Republican Party that's ever reached out to me, like, directly. And I, I mean, that's, I'm glad we were there to do it, but I'm sad that no one was there to do it before. So we did that, and we also did digital ads. We did over 31 million impressions to persuadable 18 to 29 year olds in those same states. Um, our ads didn't look like regular ads. <laughs> we based them on shows like Shark Tank and The Bachelorette and all kinds of fun stuff to kind of grab people's attention. Yeah, like the Democrats, the, the, uh, the guy that doesn't pay the bill at the end of dinner and <laughs> we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and so it doesn't look like, you know, normal political ads and got their attention and we really saw a lot of success uh, with those ads, which I'm happy to address on campus or ad-wise, our success there? Well, I guess my, my question is, um, you know, I always say that, you know, I often get the question myself, why is it that young people vote for liberals and why is it that they are liberal? And my response is always, look, you can't blame young people for, know, for not knowing something that they've never been told, right? I mean, they've never been told a lot of these times what the other side of, of the picture is, what the other political ideology, ideology is, what their other options are. So my question is, I guess, how is the CRNC reaching out to young people on a philosophical level, not just in terms of maybe grabbing attention, but actually teaching people the other side of the liberty argument and, and, and personalizing it in a way that's not too abstract for them to understand. Sure, you can talk about liberty, you can talk about freedom, but what does that actually mean in terms of an individual person? It's, it's the freedom to get an Uber on any corner in the country that you want when Hillary Clinton wants to take that away from you, right? It's the freedom to drive your vehicle across the country if you want to go on a road trip without the government telling you how much gas you're allowed to buy or how, what car you're allowed to do it in. Is there a, a strategy and a plan to really make it personal so people who maybe haven't been taught the other side of the story think about their own life and go, I don't want the government telling me what to do? So I'm really glad you asked that question because, you know, like I said, our strategy last year was twofold. It was field reps on campuses and it was digital ads on 
playing on those same campus zip codes. And what we, our thinking behind that was, was the, at least the, um, the online ads, even though they are a little more lighthearted, um, they're a little more creative, um, we, from our research, knew that young people were just sort of tuning out politics as usual. So it's really easy, I think, to get the form right in some cases. And gosh, if a Republican goes on, on you know, line somewhere, I, I mean, I applaud them just for doing that. But if you just put up that same like direct to camera candidate ad or the same like he kills puppies attack ad, that's just not going to work for millennials because I mean this is a, ge a generation that values authenticity over anything else, and those ads are just seen by this generation as wholly inauthentic. So we can't, you know, we have to be sensitive about what we put on these channels. And the reason why we did the ads we did is because we wanted to grab their attention for the 15 or 30 seconds we'd have them on Hulu. But you're right, we felt like there would be a deficit then in the substance part of it. You know, how are we convincing them to? To, to join our cause long term, you know, how do we plant those seeds? And so our thinking was that, is that the digital ads would touch a lot of people. The field reps would only be able to touch, you know, a few a few thousand people on campus, whereas you know the the the, the ads could touch tens of thousands of people. So we kind of combine the personal with the impersonal to reach the greatest amount of people possible. Um, that being said, on the peer-to-peer -peer outreach that we had going on on campus. I mean, this is something that the Obama campaign was masterful at in 2008 and 2012. I mean, you know, down to the dorm room, they knew, you know, just, you know, who was persuadable and who would be worth having a conversation with. And I think just showing up and starting that conversation is what we found to be the most important element to our success. So what we would do is we would knock on the door of a fraternity or sorority and say like, hi, I'm Alex, I'm with College Republicans. And they'd be like, ah, College Republicans, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> we're like, no, 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 we're not here to talk about politics. We're here to talk about you, how you're involved in the community on your campus and how we can help you with that. So we would sponsor back to school events, we'd sponsor the sports teams, the, like sort of the intramural uh, teams, we would sponsor just different events um, so that this community knew that we were invested in them as much as we hoped that they would be invested in us. So that's what started the relationship. And I think that when you start from a place of, of stewardship in that way, it makes having a conversation about politics that much easier. Simply just sort of walking up to someone with like a pocket constitution and saying like, here you go, that's just not gonna do it. I mean, people, you know, I think on campuses, even if they're prone to be a little bit more liberal, they're also just a little turned off from politics in general. So you think you have to kind of go in with a softer approach. And that's exactly what we found on these campuses was going in with that, um, that softer approach very much helped us. That being said, once we were in the door, once we had established relationships with people, genuine relationships, I mean, this was really not just you know, our attempt to kind of sneak in there, grab a few, and then, and then walk away. I mean, we really wanted to make sure that we were impacting um, the, the movement long term. And so once we were in those, those you know, clubs or you know, Greek life or whatever it was, we then started to have those conversations. Like, have you heard about the upcoming election? Do you know sort of like what's going on in the governor's race? Do you know who these candidates are? Um, you know, are you aware that these candidates have proposed, you know, these kinds of measures? And we sort of talked to them about it. And using the language from our yiam.gop um, sort of language set, we applied these um, the, this new language that adopts technology, that adopts sort of this disruptive change narrative. Um, to whatever race was going on in their state. And so, like, you know, a good example, talking to a club in Florida, you know, we would say, okay, so, you know, you believe, you, you, you agree with us that everything that works in your life works because it's natural and organic. All right, so then why do you want Charlie Chris coming in here and raising your tuition dollars, you know, sort of implementing a top-down system of government in Florida that's going to hurt you and your job prospects long term? So finding your, like you said, a way to bring, you know, to, uh, to make it relatable, to make it personal, um, using sort of the abstract language that we did, applying it to the current race, applying it to their current lives through personal peer-to-peer -peer conversations is really how we did it, and we just found tremendous success with, uh, with that approach. So we're actually running out of time. We've got 10 minutes left, so my final question will be, how can people who are a little bit older than the uh, millennial generation get in touch and actually help to not convert, but maybe reach out to uh, millennials who either A, aren't politically involved, or maybe who can be swayable when it comes to the issues? 
I think that's an awesome question. I mean, I, I would start by saying, I think your power as an older generation very much lies in the fact that you can influence people who, you know, are the, the same age and at the same status of life as you. And, and why is that important? Because groups that are reaching out to millennials are perennially underfunded. Um, you know, they're perhaps marginalized by sort of these myths out there that all young voters are liberal, we're not gonna reach out to them, that kind of mentality. Um, and so you can, and, and also to you have influence over the candidates, whether it's your, your checkbooks, whether it's your, um, you know, the blogs that you write or the different people you know in your community. I mean, you have influence over the people that we're trying to convince young people to vote for at the end of the day. And so if you, you know, for example, go to a candidate and say, how much of your, your uh, you know, press them on these issues. How much of your, your budget is dedicated to digital? How many millennials are, are in your district? Do you know how they voted the last time? Do you know how many more are gonna vote this time? Really make sure that they understand the, the power and the influence of the youth vote, particularly in a presidential cycle. There were several congressional districts that just came down to the wire and either we couldn't pick up because of the fact that there were too many millennials in the district that voted the wrong way last time, um, or even just down to smaller state reps and uh, mayor mayoral races. I mean, it really matters in a lot of these places. Uh, so I think just starting there as influencers with the community that you're in could be really helpful to us. Um, but, you know, like I said, I think that starting with, with conversations that don't come from a hostile place, don't come from sort of a, a demeaning place, can really make all the difference. If you're just sort of talking with someone and sort of ease into that conversation about conservative principles and really show, you know, kind of like a <laughs> parents disguising broccoli as something else for dinner, you know, I mean, really, because <laughs> I mean, there's a terrible brand out there for us, there is, and, but at the end of the day, they agree with our principles, they know that they're good for them, so, you know, don't come at them from such a, like, a hard place or from such a, you know, a, a typical place, like, use new language, use new examples, uh, and, you know, I mean, if, I think that I get this question a lot, like, you know, why do we need to talk to these young people anyway? Well, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe, you know, Alex Smith, college Republican chair, Katie Pavlich, you know, believe Ronald Reagan. You know, in his 1977 speech to CPAC, he mentioned that he was interested in creating a new Republican Party. And what did that new Republican Party do, he envisioned? It reached out to all voters. It made conservatism accessible to all voters in all places. Uh, and I really take heart with that with millennial voters, that there are ways that we can, that we can repurpose our message, we can rebrand our message, and we need your help, we need your influence to do that, certainly. All right, we have time for about two questions, so in the yellow shirt. Absolutely. We talk to candidates all the time. If I have the privilege of being in front of a candidate, I'll, I'll bring my soapbox and, and all my statistics and everything and, uh, and try to persuade them with, you know, you, the same way that I, I've, you know, spoken to all of you today. Uh, and I've been really privileged by the fact that we've had many of the, the 2016 presidential campaigns reach out to us and to, to ask us, you know, sort of what, what have you seen works? Like they're thinking long term. Um, I think it's really easy to get wrapped up in these, you know, in the primaries and the caucuses. And certainly that's an important role we play as Republicans is, is selecting that nominee and, and, and doing it through the process that we do it through. But if we're doing so at the expense of not thinking about millennial voters in the general election. I mean, you know, as Katie said, that's just political suicide. We can't do that. So we talk to candidates all the time. But the one thing I talk to candidates about, and I don't care what they're running for, if it's mayor or if it's president, my, my one plea is go to campus. Please go to campus. I mean, if you don't go to campus, our 18-year-old college Republicans are bearing the weight of the damaged Republican brand on, the, on their backs with no help and no support. And I'm sorry, if you're afraid of a few protesters from the environmental club, you don't deserve to be running for president or anything no, anyway. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs>
It, it is so true. I mean, in 2012, Barack Obama visited significantly more college campuses than Mitt Romney did. And it, it really was, there really was no excuse for it. I mean, Mitt Romney, with his business background, at least could have gotten on college campuses from the business uh, school perspective. And it, it just didn't happen in the way that it should. So that's absolutely a, a very good point when it comes to uh, uh, getting candidates on campus. And the only one quick point I'll make on that is actually now Governor Romney is speaking to business schools yeah, and they're, they're totally, <laughs> you know, it, it's really fun to watch him before these like very liberal crowds of business, uh, you know, business students, but kind of using that, uh, that softer, more sort of um, indirect approach, he's really, you know, making people see that conservative principles do work. Uh, and I will say this one more point too, that Millennials identify as independent more than any other political affiliation. So if you go to campus, there's an opportunity to win back young people, particularly with smaller conversations in coffee shops or in town halls. There's an opportunity there, and it shouldn't be missed. In the red, back there. Last question. Oh. I mean, it, it's certainly important because that's where young people are consuming information but if you know I mean, that can't be all that we do um, we need to make sure that we're out there in those campus communities that we're talking to young people because I mean that's what de just Democrats do very well they, they get down they, they, they talk to people in those communities they they use neighbors and friends to do it um, and so the, you know the Obama strategy was not just all about digital it was about having that peer-to-peer -peer outreach whether it was in just sort of a basic community or a campus community so it's really important to have that as well I want to get this one last question in from this young man over here who's in high school and he's here at Red State so I think that it's awesome that he's here and I was talking to him in the hall yesterday and his family is actually from China which is awesome so what is your question Well, I think that we are. I mean, if you look at the, uh, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, should Republicans be running uh, younger, more minority candidates uh, in the presidential race? And, my, my, and should they be doing the same thing in terms of what the left did with Barack Obama with the diversity argument and the youth argument? Um, and I would argue that we're doing that this time around. I mean, the Washington Post has deemed this presidential, uh, the GOP presidential primary as one of the most diverse fields, not only in recent generations, but in the history of the country. Um, and so I think that we are doing that. And then we're not doing it just based on the fact that people are young or minorities. We're doing it because these people have incredible backgrounds and a solid platform to stand on, even though they may vary uh, from, from place to place in terms of a couple of issues. So I would say that we are doing that. And I think that the country is act reacting positively considering the first GOP debate had 24 million viewers, which was the most out of, I think, all cable um, and beat records. So I think that we are doing that. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I completely agree. I think that this, this, can or this uh, um, slate of candidates we have is tremendous and, and, you know, just really exciting for our party and for our country at this time. Um, but we actually, we asked a lot of questions about that in our research. We wanted to know sort of to what extent do demographic factors make it or influence your opinion about candidates. And by and large, I mean, sure, I mean, is it helpful to have, um, you know, someone who can relate to you on some meaningful level, whether that's your background or, you know, your economic status? Absolutely. And we need more minority. We need more female candidates in the party. Um, you know, an organization to check out who's doing that is the Republican State Leadership Committee, RSLC. They do an incredible job with candidate recruitment um, on that level through their Future Majority Project. So that would be, I think, an interesting place for you to start, maybe intern. Um, yes. <laughs> but I, I think that, it, so in our research, we, we asked that question. And by and large, what young people want to see the most in a candidate is that they're problem solvers that aren't willing to, or that are willing to tackle the big issues of the day and aren't afraid to do so. Um, that is the, those are the number one qualities they want to see in a leader. I mean, that's what gets nearly upwards of 90% approval with millennial voters. And, you know, I think that young people, while they might take into account age and race and other factors, 
that, that's, those are the money qualities. So, you know, that's what you really want to see, I think, in a candidate, um, especially in this day and age where there's so much work that needs to be done in this country. So the moral of the story is don't count the millennial generation out. They're a big generation, they're persuadable, and they're gonna have a huge influence, not just in this presidential election, but also on future elections as well. Thanks to Alex Smith for being here today. And thanks to all of you as well.